The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being on the Hill this week. We greatly appreciate it. And I wanted to change subjects. You've uh, had a lot of good interaction today. And I want to talk a little bit about a rising interest rate environment and the impact on uh, the Fed itself. Uh, the New York Fed released projections for the Fed's balance sheet as a part of its annual overview of its 2021 open market activities. And they announced to the public that uh, the Fed portfolio could run a projected loss of about $300 billion through 2024 as interest rates continue to rise, since you have an enormous, <clears throat> the biggest in the world, I guess, uh, fixed income portfolio. The Fed's most recent financial statements for the first quarter show an unrealized capital loss of $450 billion during the quarter. So my first question is, um, does the Fed need a positive capital cushion in order to carry out its mission as our central bank? No, we, we don't. Can you explain to people why not? Sure. So what we do is, um, you know, our liabilities, our currency, for example, is a liability to us. And it doesn't earn, we don't pay any interest on it, but we own the, the contrary asset as Treasury bills. So we actually have substantial earnings, and we give those to the Treasury Department by law. Uh, over the course of the year, and we've given a trillion dollars worth of, of, uh, of those earnings to right. the Treasury Department right. over the year. So we don't retain it as capital because we don't need it. It's, it's literally not required uh, for us to conduct the operations and do monetary policy. We don't, and we have a very thin sliver of capital, but it's sort of symbolic. It's right. just not something. We're not a private institution. So as interest rates uh, increase and you have to pay out uh, interest on reserves and you've got about $9 billion, I think, of operating expenses, there is a point in this interest rate increase where potentially you'd be at an operating loss, I take it, and that you would not be uh, having a profit to distribute to the Treasury. Is that possible? Yes, that can happen, but again, it will have no effect on our ability, no, no effect whatsoever on our ability to conduct policy, and it's not something we would consider in setting policy. Right, and you just would treat that as a deferred asset, is that right? Yes, in other words, this is money you owe back to the, the Treasury when you start making a profit. You'd pay that deferred, you'd write that deferred asset off, right? That's exactly right, and we'll pay it back down to zero. So how does it then, since the Congress has imposed on the Fed an obligation to pay for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, all their operating expenses, they just send you a memo and ask you to pay for that when you don't have cash. Is that added into that deferred account asset? Yes, as a practical matter, it would be. It's, it's, it would be very it's small. It's small compared to your overall operation, but yeah. it's one of those, I think, errors I think Congress made, honestly, by imposing on our independent central bank you know, an obligation to, in theory, fund an on-budget operation. In, in retrospect, over the last 10 years, do you agree philosophically that ideally the Fed earnings wouldn't be earmarked for a particular on-budget operation? You know, in a, in, a, um, in a perfect world, we would fund agencies through different means. Either, either you know, many of them are self-funding, they, yeah. they, they get funding... Yeah, I agree with you. I think it ought to be on appropriations. I've always felt that way. I think it puts the Fed in an unusual position. And here, as rates rise and your earnings uh, may go negative as you pay out more earnings than you obtain and unrealized losses, this just puts that in mind. Uh, let me thank you. Last time we were together and you were before the committee, uh, we noted in the review that the rules uh, uh, regarding potential monetary policy rules had not been included in the report to Congress. So thank you for putting those uh, back in uh, to uh, the Congress. Uh, and I heard uh, you talk to Senator Tillis yesterday about the importance of, of rules. Can you tell us again uh, uh, how you use rules like the Taylor Rule to help guide you in, in interest rate policy? So they're, they're just embedded in, our, in the work that we do, deeply embedded. And basically, any time you make a forecast, you have to make an assumption about monetary policy. And, and so what you do is you use a, some form of a, of a Taylor rule, and there are, many, there are many different iterations at this point. I think, but more fundamentally than that, you know, that we, we do try to be systematic in monetary policy. And rules, yeah. you consult rules and help. So let me uh, just, in the few seconds yeah. remaining, Taylor Rule indicates, I think, short-term rates might be in the range of 6%. You're not there yet, obviously, to fight inflation. How do you get there in, uh, 
over what period of time? So the, the real test is is that financial conditions need to be having the they need to be in a, in a in a place where they're where they're causing the desired outcome in the in the economy, and that's what we, and so there's been so much tightening that isn't reflected in the in the overnight rate yet. Right. So really, we've we've done a whole lot more than the changes in the overnight right. rate would. I thank the chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank.